everyone. Welcome to another virtual Talks at Google event. I am Alan Seals from the Talks team, and I am extremely excited for our guest today. But before we begin, I just want to remind everyone to feel free to use the chat on your, I think, your left, uh, right side of the screen, your left, if you're mirrored. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, use the chat, put in your comments, make sure to drop any questions in there, because we're going to be taking audience questions later on in the event. So today's guest is a Tony and Grammy Award winner, an author, director, composer, and of course, an actor whom you probably best know from originating the role of Aaron Burr in both the off-Broadway and Broadway productions of Hamilton. You may have also seen him on TV recently in Smash, Law and Order, Gotham, The Good Wife, and a dozen more, in addition to some amazing film credits, including one of my personal favorites, Murder on the Orient Express. In addition, he is playing the legendary Sam Cooke in a new amazing original drama called One Night in Miami, scheduled to be released in theaters this Christmas day and then on Amazon uh, in January. And now he's got a brand new holiday album called A Christmas Album. Leslie Odom Jr., welcome to Talks at Google. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And I'm, I'm sure... Uh, there's a lot that's been happening in our in our world in our country recently. So I want to yeah. thank you thank you for taking the time and and giving us the attention today. Um, and then I think this is actually just kind of a natural segue into talking about about the album itself because it's a holiday album and the holidays. I, I gathered from kind of reading about you when I was researching for this that the holidays and Christmas time in particular are sort of extra special for you. So like coming into the close of the year, the end of a chapter, start of a new one, holidays are here. Like, why this album now? Well, it was really a part of a pivot. Um, you know, all of us have had to become, I was gonna say masters of the pivot, but it's not not quite masters, you know, um, regular practitioners of the pivot. Because uh, I, was, I was on tour for this album that I put everything into last year. Uh, my first original album of all, you know, all original music. I spent about two years putting this record together and everybody told me you can't just make a record and think that it's going to find its way to people. You know, you have, you have to really take it around the country and introduce people to it and shake hands and let people meet you in that way. And so I plan to do that. And then COVID, like everybody, COVID caught us all in the middle of something. And so I came home. We did two two stops on the tour. We opened in LA, we went to Vegas, and then we had to shut down. So I came home. I wasn't thinking about making music or anything like that. I just wanted to be home with my family and kind of take stock. And we were I just felt like we were bracing for impact in a lot of ways. You know, how bad is this thing gonna get? Fast forward a little bit, two, three months into the quarantine. My wife's probably a little sick of me by now. My daughter's sick of looking at my silly face. <laughs> and uh, I just tried to figure out how to be creative again. And so I got that same, you know, while we couldn't tour together, we, we tried to imagine, figure out a way that we could be creative again um, during this time. And we made this, we got together to make the Christmas album. Believe it or not, the thing that I hear the most about in my career after Hamilton is the last Christmas album I made. So I just tried to imagine what people might be in need of on this very unique Christmas at the end of a really tough year and, and just try to serve that up. Well, it is, I guess, approaching this though, um, I mean, the, uh, the work that goes into writing songs and prepping an album and finding collaborators, if you choose to, to have collaborators, all of that starts months and months ago. And it sounds like in the middle of the pandemic is when you decided on, on doing that. But I wanna call out too that the album has a its its original songs and and your holiday classics, right? Yeah. So why well, we had we we had we had got, sorry. What was your question? Sorry. Why did what? Oh no, I was gonna say, I was gonna say why why decide to go one way or the other or do the mix between the two? What I knew after the last Christmas album, which which believe it or not came out. Um, like November 2nd, 2016. <laughs> so the day after, uh, or the day after the election on 2016, I was in New York City and I had to 
I had like performances scheduled that day. Um, and um, it was it was a very strange time to be singing Christmas music. So this was not, you know, again, <laughs> I, I would have, um, but for the pandemic and everything, I would not have even made a Christmas album. That was not on my agenda. But because I had spent, I knew that after putting out that album, that like the next step for me as an artist, if I was going to really um, make a run at being a, a an artist and not like a wedding band singer, not you know, not no, there's anything wrong with being a wedding band singer or a karaoke singer, you know. I just I knew that I needed to write original music. I needed to develop my own voice as an artist, which is what we did on Mister, which is what we were about to go on the road and travel all around North America and tell people about, and we couldn't do. So because Mister, I mean, and that's hard one. You know, I think Mister is a big success for me. You know, as far as um, uh, lassoing my voice and really figuring that thing out. So um, while we couldn't tour, I guess kind of the way we celebrated was we got back together and and just kind of moved the ball down the field a little bit more because that those songs, you know, we'd spent I spent a year in the studio recording Mister this this album. I didn't have a year, you know, we did this album in about a month and a half, but you know, you know, the, the team was already warm. You know, we, we'd already figured our thing out on that last record. Were you able to go into a studio and record this or, or were you recording at home? We did. So I did, um, I was a part of, my wife and I were a part of the first big production in LA to get back up on its feet during COVID was a, a little show called Love in the Time of Corona on Freeform. But at the time, that was the biggest production happening in LA. And they figured out a way to get a very, very small crew into your home. Part of, we were uh, executive producers on the show too. And part of what made it work was that they were getting performers that were quarantined together. So my wife and I did this little, uh, sweet little like four part mini series for Freeform, but we learned a lot. We learned about this is back in like June or July. You know, we were learning about okay, so this is how you you this is the testing process. There was a company that we found in LA called Blue Moon that uses a plant based solution. They'll come and they'll fog a space um, to that it kills the virus in the air. They use UV lights. So you know, in every way possible, and you're still keeping social distancing, you're still wearing masks, you're still washing your hands, all that stuff. So we managed to shoot this thing and you know, knock on something. You know, we got out of that production with no positives. And um, we did the same thing with the studio. So it's a risk. Anybody going back to work right now or going back to school right now is taking a risk a little bit, especially because there hasn't really been a unified national response to this. People are doing this ad hoc. You know, I'm sure you're experiencing the same thing. It's it's up to a personal family. It's up to a personal community, what you're willing to risk and what you're not. So we just, we made this album as safe as possible. We got our COVID tests. I had Blue Moon up in the studio and we were the, we did a, a lock in. So we were the only ones, we were, we became a little bubble. You know, we were the only ones in the studio during that time. That's wonderful. And actually this is uh, a question that just came in that I want to jump to real quick before we shift away from the album. Obviously it was very important to make the album it is Valerie asks, what do you hope for us to feel when we listen to the Christmas album? Such a great question. I, um, first and foremost, joy. You know, if you listen to if you listen to the last album, like I said, that was that is one of the most popular things that I've put out for me. You know, it's it's outsold my debut album by like three times or something. Because also, Christmas albums are perennial; they come back every year, so people discover it every year. Um, but that first album is sincere and it's heartfelt. That was that was my primary focus for that time. I just really want, I, you know, Christmas music can be so saccharine and, and cheesy, you know, and I, and I did not want to put out an album like that. I wanted to put out an honest, um, heartfelt project. This album, my first, my, my, the thing that I wanted most was that this album felt joyful from the time you pushed play, right from the beginning, I wanted joy. So you listen to the first three, three tracks and you tell me if I, you know, if I achieved it, but I, I certainly, <laughs> you know, I, I feel like I did. Um, so that's the first thing. And then I really think, you know, my responsibility as an artist 
I think art is here. You know, I can't wait for theater to come back. I can't wait till people can gather at movie theaters again because I, I think that art serves a real, does a real service and serves a real purpose in civilized society uh, and has for centuries. It is, you know, the, the purpose of art, I believe, is for catharsis, for, for a, a people to gather in a room and in a common space. And art is supposed to trigger spontaneous rush of emotion, spontaneous. There's something healing about that. And that is laughter. And that is um, uh, any emotion you can think of, laughter, uh, the, the tears, the joy, all, you know, that's what we're here to do. And so certainly on the last half of the record, you know, I'm, for anybody that needs it, you know, I want to make space for the pain that has been present this year and the loss that has been present this year. So it's a mix of both. We got side A that's there for all your joy and side B that's there to uh, commiserate with you in your pain. That's beautiful. All right, so for those who haven't listened to it yet, in the in the notes for this YouTube link that you're watching now, uh, there's a link to buy and uh, stream the album, however you choose. So please check that out. But I want to pivot here real quick, or not okay. real quick, but we're gonna. I want to talk about you because we haven't been talking about me. <laughs> we're gonna talk about your album. Now we're gonna talk about your question. Uh, <laughs> is it like okay? So. I want to go backwards kind of in your career, more or less. I'm going to jump around some, but um, Let me get your it. career seemed to have been shot out of a cannon, right? You were saying that the art heals. You were saying that art is cathartic. The people who need art, like they're in there, they have to create. People, even in this pandemic time, artists are still finding ways to create. You are case in point. You found your way to create. And you you made your Broadway debut in Rent when you were 17, yeah? It was... yeah. Well, uh, I have it in my notes somewhere and I lost my place, but it's somewhere in here. Yeah, it was late 1990s, major Broadway yeah. debut. And we're doing like regional stuff, some out of town tryouts, La Jolla, uh, California. Yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then Hamilton shows up. Yeah. And well, actually, before we get to Hamilton, I'm going to talk about Leap of Faith because Leap <laughs> of Faith <laughs> had, oh goodness, a dozen and a half or so performances. That's right. That's right. And then went on Broadway, on yeah, Broadway right? Faith, your, your audience might not just a Leap of Faith was a Broadway show that was based on that Steve Martin movie. Do you guys remember that movie about, about uh, a charismatic charlatan that comes to a town and gets a bunch of people to believe some promises that aren't true? Um, and it's, it's, I think it's loosely based on the, the Rainmaker, but it was a big movie in the 90s and they turned that into a Broadway show. Alan Menken, huge songwriter, turned that into a Broadway show. And we ran for two and a half weeks as Alan rubs in, <laughs> as Alan just takes some salt and just rubs. No, I like I like to keep it real in my conversations. So it's like starring Rola Sparza, directed by Chris Ashley, Alan Menken, and like on paper, one of the, the it was like, this is gonna be great. And sure. then it come, comes to Broadway, brings you back to New York because you had left New York. Yeah. You grew up in Queens or, or born in Queens. Yeah, you're right. Yes. Um, went to California, came back with this. Was was this the time in your life when you were like, all right, I've been struggling. I'm an artist. I, I'm working, working hard. And this is it. This is going to be my break. Good question. Um, I, I didn't necessarily feel that. I really was. I fought to be a part of Leap of Faith. I had to. I was a part of another very divisive show at the very at the same time. So you know, that was the, the divisive years. I was on Smash at the same time that Leap of Faith was opening on Broadway, and I really wanted that experience. I, I hadn't had the experience of putting up uh, being in an original cast. That is a that is a big thing for a performer, even a flop. You know, even a flop is an experience. It is a it is a it can be a badge of honor in certain cir certain circles, um, or it's a or it's a huge heartbreak and it and it reroutes you in some way. It changes you in some way. But you have to do it. You must do it. And so, leap of faith was my chance to be a part of an original company. However, it went. However, it turned out. And I, it was a 
really interesting, wonderful experience. But I, I had a wonderful time, you know, doing it and and it, and watching. <laughs> we couldn't give those tickets away. We could not <laughs> give them away. Right? Yeah, I, I mean, I. I, I want to also call out that you also have, you wrote a book in 2018 called Failing yeah. Up, How to Take Risks, Aim Higher, Never Stop Learning. So what did you learn coming out of that? I learned to take nothing for granted. I learned to, to, to it was a confirmation of one thing is that you, you know, as an artist, it really, or as a creator, because I know I'm not just talking to artists, but I know that there's some creators under the sound of our voices right now. That's great. You gotta be, you gotta do your best to stay honest with yourself. You gotta keep it real with yourself and, and surround yourself with people who are going to do the same. So Leap of Faith was not the worst show in the whole world, but it was flawed. And I knew that. And people close to me knew that. So you 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 can take the best of it. You can, you can. You don't have to flush the whole thing down the toilet. You know, there were some wonderful things about it, but you, you know, it is so, so that you don't feel like the rug. I didn't feel like even closing after two weeks, it didn't feel like the rug was pulled completely out from under me. You know, I, I did, I didn't think leap of faith was Hamilton for instance. You know what I mean? I, I just, I knew what it was. And so it was a confirmation of that, you know, I, I just, I, over the years, I remember going to see certain performers, friends of dear friends who were in, you know, they're in a show that's not great. And you go backstage to see them and it's almost like they don't know. It's almost <laughs> like New York, you know, New York has this secret that like they're not aware of. I don't want to live in that kind of bubble. I don't want that, you know? Um, and so in a lot of ways, 2016 was like that for a lot of us, right? You know, that we that that there was there was something happening that we just didn't feel there was a we're, we're certainly very, very aware of the other half of the conversation right now. But in 2016, we were just like, wait, what? So anyway, I don't want to live in those kind of bubbles. I really don't. So if, if I'm a part of something that people are not responding to, if I'm a part of something that's not great, first of all, I want to know it because everything I try, you know, these are some of these, they're experiments. Not all of them are going to turn out great. So I want to know that. Anyway, so that, and then, and then it just helped me um, not take things for granted. You know, just because you're in a Broadway show doesn't mean you're in a successful Broadway show. It's like, congrats on being in a Broadway show, save your money and see how it goes. I mean, look at what's happening right now. I mean, you have all these successful Broadway shows that aren't running because we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Crazy and so and sad. For those who don't know who are watching or listening right now, as we record this in the beginning of November, 2020, May, uh, Broadway's not scheduled to come back until May 30th, 2021, which probably means longer than that. Yep. So just support your artists wherever you can, but. Amen. Going back to, you know, Leap of Faith on paper, totally great. The opposite of that. Someone came up once, I remember in, it was 2015, I think, early 2015. And someone was like, man, there's this new thing at the public. It's called, it's about like Hamilton, but they, but the founding fathers, but they rap about it. You got to go see it. And I was like, huh? So. That's, that's terrible. All right. Right. On paper, again, like the description, the elevator pitch, I was like, a history lesson that's being okay i guess i'll go check it out and obviously now it has joined the ranks thanks to your help thanks to your creation your your origination is now joined the ranks of these shows like lion king and wicked and phantom that are obviously going to run for decades like this is this is so important for us to continue it's not the story alone but also the representation that the casting the casting shows us. Yeah. And so my question and all wrapped in all of this is when you were going through the process, I guess two questions. First off, when did when did you start to get attached to the off-Broadway production? Because I know you were working with Lynn with Tick Tick Boom earlier. Um, and then when did you realize this was gonna really take off? Like mm. I know you knew it was gonna be good. But when yeah. was it like all of a sudden, like, holy crap, this is sure. different? Sure. Um, uh, I got involved. So before the public, I'd been involved for almost two years of development because what you what I learned over the years, you know, uh, being in the business is that usually when once the public is hearing about something or even 
if you're in the belt, you know, once I'm getting an audition for something that's about to go to Broadway, it's been in development for years. So like the a lot of times the best parts are already gone. So with Hamilton, you know, I, I knew I knew getting it on the ground floor of a of something that brilliant, it was it really was up to me to hold on for dear life, to make sure that no other projects, no other shiny thing came along to take me away from it. Because I knew what I knew having had the leap of faith experience was let me take it a little bit deeper, because this is like why not have a deep conversation? Please. Like, you know, at some point you have to define for yourself, you have to really know why you're on your path, know what you're in it for. If it's money, if it's chicks, if it's um, love, you know, you didn't get enough love somewhere and you're looking to fill a hole, you know, whatever those things are, be, be as honest with yourself as possible about those things, because when it comes along, you don't want to miss it, right? If you got, if you got in it and you're in it for the cash, when the cash comes along, don't miss, don't miss it. Take the cash. <laughs> Follow the money. So for me, I got in this thing. You know, Rent was the show that brought me to the theater. And my favorite quote about art and artists is that an artist spends their entire life trying to get back to the place where their heart was first opened up. To me, I think the trifecta for a piece of art is if something is, it is very rare. If something is, if something is, artistically fulfilling, culturally relevant, and commercially successful. That's the trifecta, it doesn't it, it, More often than not, you're in some off-Broadway show that you're feeding your artistic soul and you know, you can't get your mom to come. She's like, I don't wanna sit through that nonsense, you know? So, <laughs> so but, but my first experience was Rent. That was all of those things. Rent was a part of the cultural conversation. It was making money at the box office and those performers were filled up. You could see it in them. So here's Hamilton. And I knew, I knew that this is what I got in it for. I recognized it as that. I didn't know if the third, the, the third piece, I, I didn't know if, if it would be, um, commercially successful, time had to tell me that, and I'll answer that question in a second. But what I'm saying is that I knew it when it came. And so even when we were making no money, even when you know it was a couple hundred bucks a week to be a part of the development, at the public theater, I was gonna make $400 a week in New York City. I had a, I had a $500,000 contract on television that I had to walk away from, a guaranteed half a million dollars on NBC that I had, to, I had to quit that job to make sure that I stayed a part of Hamilton because I knew it when I saw it. Wow. I did not get in this. I, if, if nothing else is going on, great. The, the TV show, that's, I, I love half a million dollars. That sounds great. But that I'm not distracted by the shiny thing. This is what I got in it for. So I knew how I felt about it. I didn't know how all of you would feel about it. I hoped that you would, that we would see the same things, but I didn't know if the show would close in two weeks the same way Leap of Faith did. I didn't know if so much of great art and great artists, things that we deem to be great art and great artists, you know, they're, they're not celebrated in their time. These are things that we discover later. Art, some you know, artists that we revere die penniless and 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 heartbroken that they were never accepted. So I didn't know if that would be the story of Hamilton. If someday some kid discovers what we made at the public theater and knows how special it was. So fast forward. So I had an idea off Broadway when we kept getting extended. Certainly, and and this this little three hundred seat theater that we're in in New York City. You know. It's getting harder for the for the the cast to get tickets for our own people. You know, I knew that something's happening here, but yeah, it was it was Broadway was really the coronation for the show when it was you know when when it was celebrated in every way that <laughs> something can be celebrated. It was celebrated in the press. It was celebrated <clears throat> with box office receipts. It was celebrated with awards and showered with those kind of things. I mean, the other thing. I want to say that's really important is when it comes, when the dream comes, you have to let it satiate. You can't be a bottomless need 
a, just a bottomless hole that nothing will ever satisfy. No amount of love, no amount of praise, no amount of success will ever fill this bottomless desire for whatever. You know, my dream showed up. I recognized it when it was in front of me and I was, and I was so satisfied, deeply satisfied with having it work out. I am legitimately speechless and holding back tears right now as someone who has gone through my own mental health journey and really been searching, especially this year being, you know, quarantined at home and missing the arts as desperately as I and my, my peers do. Like th this is just so crucial to know <sighs> the, <laughs> on, yeah, I guess on, yeah. both, on both sides of the of the stage, on both sides of the curtain, the people on it and the people watching it. What you're in it for? What What are you doing it for? Why do you need it? And I love, I love that what you said about you know not being a bottomless hole. Because some people, me being one of them for a long time, was it's just never good enough. And I got where I want, and now what? And so, thank you for being real and. Yeah, man. Calling that out because that is something I think, especially now, especially going into the holidays when we're probably not going to be able to see our family like yeah. we need to due to Corona. Like this is a big deal. So <sighs> obviously, I mean, there's comments all through in here that, that yeah. um, Hamilton has changed their changed their lives. Your music has gotten them through things this year. Like these comments are crazy. You, your final performance in Hamilton was July 9th, 2016. And what we were talking about it is, you know, this is this was the thing you were looking for. And in a career, in an industry where I guess even when you're working, you're still looking for your next job. Why leave something that's as solid as Hamilton became? Because I'm out of my mind. <laughs> and I like it. Well, because um, because I, first of all, I want to say July the 9th, I remember very specifically dedicating that performance to Philando Castile, um, who was murdered in front of his girlfriend remember and her and her little and her little girl her three or four year old daughter they were in the back of that of that car and her daughter is trying to quiet down her mother because she doesn't want her mother to get murdered too so how far we've come and how far we have not come right um i remember thinking of philando so much on that day you know i wasn't dedicated that 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 wasn't a you know, there was something about Hamilton for me. I think you can see it in the performance. You know, I took it seriously. To me, it was it was ministry for me. It was ministry for me. And that is beyond religiosity. You know, ministry in that it you know, I really that stage was was pure. It was the best of me up there. I'm as I'm as wretched and as beautiful as everybody listening. You know, I'm no, I'm no perfect man. I'm no, right? But there's goodness in me. And um, and I like to have sacred space in my life that I protect. I, I like to protect the goodness in me in certain spaces of my life. And this thing that I do, this Hamilton thing, you know, Lynn gave me something so beautiful and so pure. It came from the best of him. And so it deserved the very best of me. It deserved my humblest spirit. My, um, it deserved the human in my being, you know? So, um, so I gave it all of that. And, um, and it's, it's why, it's why we were able to, you know, it's why nobody, and that, that stuff is top down, right? You know, Tommy led like that. Our director led like that. Lynn led like that with that kind of generosity, which is why we all still speak together, speak to each other, which is why nobody from that company 
is, you know, on a trip. You know what I mean? Like, you know, <laughs> you don't you don't see anybody from that company like, you know, he he really forgot who he was. He really, you know, he's out there. She's out there. We didn't do that. We weren't that kind of group. Um, so I, I I don't know you. So I think I said I just said that to say just to give some context of the guy I am. You know, I'm a, I'm a man of of faith, and I also understand how big God is. I remember my my spouse, my wife is uh, half black, half white, Jewish. And standing with my wife, and I was born, you know, uh, very, very Baptist, uh, not, you know, uh, the, the, uh, um, it, was, it was a foundational thing, you know, for us on the East Coast, but getting married, you know, under the chuppah, you know, to my wife, uh, what, seven, eight years ago, so we've been together 12 years, but seven, eight years ago. <laughs> And really, really like realizing how big God is. We like to put God in a box, man, but God is big, it's far out, all right? Anyway, so I'm a man of faith and I stepped out on faith. I said all of that to say that I stepped out on faith in the same way that I knew I could turn down the $500,000 and grab a hold of something that somebody else might think was nuts. I knew that I could let it go too. I knew that I could let it go and I would be all right. That um, I, you know, I knew I had the lessons of my life. I had the lesson of the two and a half weeks of leap of faith and the marginalization of being on a show like Smash and not being used at all. You know, Smash was a really heartbreaking experience for me being on that show. This is before everything. I'm on this show and like I felt like my hands were tied. You know, that we we weren't quite in this in this age that we are right now, that this time that we are right now. So I'm, you know, I'm the only character of color, the only series regular on this show, and they don't use me at all. You know, every chance they get, I'm sidelined and marginalized. Fine. Listen, I don't cry for me. I'm, I'm fine. I learned a lot of great lessons from that experience too. But I, I had had enough lessons in my life to know that I, that I could step on out on faith, that I could risk, that I could risk failure and, and um and and it would still be all right hmm. i feel like there's a there's something there too that that as you described yourself and how much you put how much of yourself you gave to the character and used to create the show that doing that in an open-ended way would just start to to like maybe prematurely age you for lack of <laughs> mature lack of mature me or something right yeah well just get you to a point where you're like man i don't i don't have energy I don't have energy at home anymore. Because if you're if you're leaving it all on stage, then you know what do you what do you say for yourself? Well, I you know I, it's a it's a really paradoxical thing because I I was I was exhausted, but I've never had more energy. Because when when you are in purpose, when you are when you are living on purpose, in in those in the symbolic way of that and in the literal way of that, you know, there was I was I was on purpose during that show like that is energizing that is invigorating look at this conversation that we're having right now i'm gonna be i'm gonna be flying high all day i didn't get enough <laughs> sleep last night i didn't get enough sleep last night who cares i had a great conversation with alan and google give me a break <laughs> so when, you are, when you're living like that you know i mean i the thing about hamilton you know uh eight o'clock eight o'clock p.m for a Broadway show, that's the start of my day. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody else is coming after they've, they've had a day of work and they're coming. Like, so I've also had a day, now eight o'clock rolls around, I need to be buzzing like it's nine, like it's 9 a.m. I need to be buzzing like it's 10, you know, cause I gotta come out and do a three hour thing. This is the most important part of my day. This is the ministry. So, um, so yeah, I just, all I'll say is, you know, when you're, when you're on purpose, man, I was, I've never been more exhausted and I've never been more invigorated than during that time of my life. Oh, I get that. I totally understand that. So when you left, you left in 2016, Murder, Murder in the Orient Express came out 2017. And then you had two films in 2019, along with this album in 2020. Uh, <laughs> 
So were you working on more Murder on the Orient Express in 2016 before you left Hamilton or did, or did you like hop into that afterwards? It was the first job that I took right after. Um, that was the thing, you know, Hamilton gave me the confidence because to, the confidence to leave because everybody had seen it. I, I don't want to say everybody, you know, the lot, lots of, um, there was still lots and lots, millions of people to discover the show, but I mean, in the, in the business and this thing that I do, um, where people had heard about it early and had connections to get tickets. All of those people had seen the show sometimes more than once. So I knew like now's the time if anybody's going to take my call, if I'm going to get to build anything, you know, now's the time I should, you know, capitalize on that. So yeah, Kenneth Branagh, I took the opportunity to work with Ken because I was trying to um, make the leap. So now I have the uh, people would ask me, you know, what are the, what do you want to work on after Hamilton? What to do you work on after Hamilton? And and my answer was vague, but clear. I want to work on all the things that no one would have allowed me to work on before Hamilton. I don't want to go back and do things that I was able to do. You know, there's certain things that I that I was able to do. I was doing TV. I was doing, you know, Broadway shows that lasted two and a half weeks. I don't want to do that again. You know, so I was I was already marginalized on a TV show. So now if I'm going to do a TV show, it needs to look different. I need to be valued in a different way. And film was something that nobody, I could not get arrested. Are you kidding me? Before Hamilton, nobody was putting me in a movie ever. Like, are you kidding me? So Kenneth Branagh is going to let me be in a movie with Michelle Pfeiffer and Johnny Depp and Dame Judi Dench and you know my college buddy Josh Gad so it 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 felt like a just a wonderful opportunity that I couldn't pass up to learn and to learn from Ken who was who had done so successfully the thing that I was trying to do Ken had you know was known as a stage actor and he's made that leap to not only film actor but a director and just a just a real creative so um so yeah I, I was the first job that I took after Hamilton. Well, so you, you've sort of, um, I mean, you were supposed to be spending this past year touring for, for your last album that came out in November, you were saying, but um, is that is that the current focus or like looking ahead to the future, do you see yourself more of a, of a singer, songwriter, recording artist, or do you want to come back and like originate some more shows on Broadway or TV and film or all of the above? Do you have a favorite place to be? Thank you for asking. It's just the, the next right thing, the next right thing. And the the way that I know it's a place, it's a room that I'm supposed to be in, it's a project I'm supposed to be working on is if I do not have to play small. If I don't have to leave any part of myself, I don't, I don't wanna check any parts of myself at the door anymore, I'm done. So if you want all of me, uh, you know, I wanna weigh in on what we're making. You know, I don't have to have the loudest voice in the room, but I want a voice in the room. Um, you know, I want to be fully engaged and involved, full bodied investment from me. If you're not interested in that, that's fine. That's fine. When you're, when you are interested in that for me, let me know. And so, and what I, and the music thing for me, what that is, is that that's me, you know, I no longer am waiting for somebody to invite me to any party or give me any opportunity, you know, to be a creative, or I'm not giving over charge of my creative engine to anybody else. And I learned that in my twenties. So music is music is, is my happy place because it's mine. I can wake up and make a phone call and decide to work with whomever I'd like and make whatever songs I'd like. So when you, when you hear my music, you know, that's the, that is the purest, the purest part of me currently. That is me not compromising. That is me making the art that I want to make exactly how I want to make it. And, and I keep it that way. I keep it pure. Um, that's the ministry, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And the other stuff, the other stuff is me making myself, you know, once when I meet a collaborator like a Regina King on this One Night in Miami movie, Regina King's directorial debut on a, you know, on a film after she'd won the Oscar. This is the next thing that she did. She won her Oscar just last year. And um, that is me making myself available to tell to, to, to another artist. That is me doing what I, what I did with Lynn, you know, is when you trust someone, you go, yeah, use me. You can use me. 
tell me what you tell me how you want me to do it advise me how you want me to do you know at the end of the day that's that's regina's movie i'm there to serve i'm there to serve regina and serve kemp and my collaborators in to the best of my ability. Central Park, this little animated show I'm on for Apple that my friend Josh Gad created. I'm there to serve Josh and Lauren, their vision. That's not my show. You know, my music, that's where I that's where I do it exactly how I want to do it. So when you're approaching working with others, uh, you know, because um, Christmas, the, your holiday album here, um, you've it's got Cynthia Revo and your wife, of course, Nicolette Robinson, and and there's you know, others you've collaborated with, do you go to them and say, so this is how you want to do it? Or, or this is how I want you to do it? Or is it more of like, I've got this idea, let's work together and build it? Oh, great question. I, I mean, I think the best art comes from collaboration. So if, I, if I'm asking someone to work with me, man, I want them to feel like it is just as much theirs as it is mine. Um, I, yeah, I want them to feel that way. And then we can always find our way to to, to, you know, I don't, it's not, it's not, what is it? Zero sum, you know, it's never mm -hmm. zero. It's just like, yeah, we can, we can both find a way to be happy with this. And there's, th that is never more evident than when I'm working with Nicolette Robinson, my wife, because, you know, it's, we, our voices love singing together. Our voices blend, but we have very different processes. And, you know, it's sometimes it is like, it is delicate finding our way to something that we both love as, as, much um <laughs> the, so yeah go ahead that was the thing. there's there's somebody who's asking specifically about this uh you know how how involved is your wife with your music creation process it sounds like uh the two of you literally make you know metaphorically and literally make beautiful music together we do we do and and that's and that's been like you know 12 years in now like there's there's certain there's so much trust that's been built it takes time to build that to build that trust, but I mean, she really has. I have to say, that there's a real comfort. Um, I'm thinking, like, forgive me for like the buzzy words, forgive me, but you, you know, the, the patriarchal storytelling, you know, about the muse, about putting the woman in the in the role of the muse if she's helpful to a man at all, and. I just have to give her more credit than that. She may have, she may have started as a muse, but my wife is definitely she's an advisor. She is a partner. She is a creative consultant. You know, she helps me keep a certain level of quality. She is, you know, a, a very needed and valuable female perspective on my work. Uh, she tells me what a, what a woman is responding to and what a woman is not responding to. That is helpful. That is more than muse. Believe me. All right. Well, that is a great place, I think, for us to transition into some audience questions. So if you've got any for Leslie, drop them in here. This suit, this first one here, super serious. Are you the mushroom in the mask singer? Ah, well, you know what my standard response has been? Has been I want you to uh oh you asked me if I'm the mushroom, because first people were asking me if I was the serpent. Um, has the serpent been revealed? Well, it says or the serpent, so I guess not. Or the serpent. So yeah, so now my standard response will work. I want you to go <laughs> stream cold with Sia. <laughs> That's my standard response. Go stream cold. I have a, I have a collaboration out with Sia. The song mm -hmm. is called Cold. Go stream it. All right, so now actually a little bit more serious. You fought for pay equity for the Hamilton original cast. Is that something you want to see other Broadway productions continue to do? Hell yeah. Yes. <laughs> Full stop. I told you, I, I told you my 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 literal experience, and I'm just one, but there I had to turn down work. I had to turn down money. I was one of the original investors in Hamilton. It's not, you know. I didn't have a hundred thousand dollar check to give the show, but I gave it sweat equity. I invested in a different way, and performers should see a return on that investment. Period. Yeah, I agree. Um, so then here says you're awesome. Not a question, more of a statement. Have you and the Hamilton cast been keeping in contact or cheering one another up during COVID? Oh yeah. Uh, we 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 did a lot of we did a lot of fundraising. You know, we knew that the 
with the film coming out, it was an opportunity for us once again. And that was a surprise. The film wasn't supposed to come out until next year, if you guys remember, like, you know. Uh, but we knew with the release of the film that it was a chance for us to fundraise and to um, use our, the fact that we were, you know, of the moment to 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 do some good possibly and, and to um, raise some money and shine a light on some organizations that were important to us. And so we were regularly in contact. We have been regularly in contact over the quarantine and uh, continue to certainly this weekend, the group group text was was lighting up. Yeah. Do you still have a, uh, an original cast group text or is it Heck yeah. everybody? Yeah, yeah, everybody. Yeah. Lynn might not be <laughs> on it, but yeah, everybody. Yeah. I suppose this phone's probably blowing up. Everyone's yeah, phone's blowing so. up. We, the, sometimes the, we don't want to bother him with the nonsense. Yes. We, <laughs> he, he's, I'm sure he's very grateful to not be on it. He's like, yeah, you guys have that. So speaking of Sia, Trisha wants to know what drew you to work with her, both on the music and in the movie. Music? Oh, movie oh, music? Yeah. yeah, there's a movie. She, Sia direct. Uh, what drew me to work with Sia is she's, you know, she's one of the um, most exciting voices, you know, in pop music. She's, she's an original. She's our, she's our David Bowie or, you know, our, <laughs> she's in the, you know, in the tradition of Grace Jones or David Bowie or uh, Laurie Anderson, you know, those, those artists that have popular success, but still manage to stay avant-garde and, and singular. So uh, yeah, I just took, she wanted to work with me. And so I was just like, are you kidding me? Just took the, the opportunity to, to work with her and learn from her. And she's taught me so much. That's awesome. Um, so on that vein too, Michaela wants to know what, who do you want to work with in the future? I keep trying to work with Janelle, who's another one in that same, in that same vein. You know, I really think Janelle is an original, such a special voice. And I, yeah, I call Janelle once or twice a year to work on something and it, it hasn't worked out yet, but it's coming. So, I, all right, well, you put it out there, it's gonna happen. Yeah. So now Ronnie said, you mentioned being valued in different roles. How does that transcribe on stage or on a Christmas album? Mm. Um, I think you're talking about when I was talking about, yeah, being valued, uh, you know, for, um, being able to bring all of myself to a project. And so on a Christmas album, I'm, I'm a producer, you know, I am, I am, I'm picking the material. I am uh, guiding and collaborating the arrangements, the, the whole thrust of the project, you know, because that's me stepping out as Leslie Odom Jr. That's my name on that thing. You know, when I'm playing Burr or Sam Cooke or, you know, any of these people is where I'm again, I'm I'm offering myself um to be a part of somebody else's vision. These albums are are all mine. And so I'm I'm director, I'm producer, I'm performer, I'm writer, I am, you know, just it uses all of me. Um, not only me, you know, it uses all of me and all of a few other people too. <laughs> I've because I've got people that I'm singing with and people that I'm writing with and producing with. So that's what I mean by that. That's, that's very, 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 very cool. I, and I suspect that because there's more of you in the, in all of the roles, do the successes and the failures mean more when, when it's your own thing versus when you're at service at the service of somebody else? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yes. You have you have so much more writing on it. Um, at the end of the day, you're going to see. I hope, and I hope all of you see it. This movie, One Night in Miami, mm -hmm. um, that's coming out Christmas Day. It's a very special movie. Um, not all the decisions in the movie are decisions I would have made. I I lobbied to have certain things changed or or looked at differently most of my suggestions were ignored you know if they were they chose to do other things um and I, you know but I, I still think it's a beautiful and special movie but but yes that is that is a very different thing I, I play a different role in a process like that so yes if I'm lucky enough to have the success of a Christmas album the success of a a collaboration with Sia 
this song cold that I love so much. Please go listen to it. If you don't <laughs> if you listen once, if you don't like it, you don't have to keep listening to it, but listen to it once. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, give it a those, shot. Just give it a try. Yeah, those things are those things are led by me. They are they are led by me. I fight for them still, as you can see. Um, yeah, so so the the wins and the losses are more personal. I want to touch on one night in Miami real quick because you brought that up, and I wanted to close out with it that you play Sam Cooke, uh, one of the most influential singer songwriters of you know of not only his time but all of music in general, yeah. right? And the as i was reading about it the story sort of centers around february 25th 1964 when muhammad ali then known as cassius clay then defeated the then heavyweight champion sonny liston and uh you know there's like there's of course somebody who's doing muhammad ali and there's you playing sam cook and we've got malcolm x in the story and like this these friends these close close friends were going through this whole thing and this was the final year of sam's life didn't know it at the time because this he he was he was killed December 11th, 1964, at the end of that year. Yeah. So when when you're looking at this project, uh, I guess the hard part about casting icons, these are icons, these are all people that the world knows. I mean, is that is that something that you take into account or is it just another role, just another offer or like, are you, do you have doubt inside or do you have uh, a sort of excitement of like, I'm going to bring myself to this and give it a, give this character a side no one's seen before. <laughs> I ran from this movie for a month. I, you know, they kept saying they wanted me to come into audition for this movie. And I was like, you guys, I'm not Sam Cooke. I'm not auditioning for this movie. Respectfully, the answer is no. Um, and then my my agent and my manager called me. They never do that, you know. I've, again, I've been in relationship with these people, and usually when they when they call me, it's usually they if whenever I book a thing, you know, the whole team calls you to all congratulate. That's that's like a that's a regular thing. But usually, I'm only hearing from one of them, you know. So them call Leslie. We have a you know call from Annie and Jamie. I'm like, did I book something? I you know. And they were just calling to say we really think you're making a mistake. You have to look at this thing. You have to look at this movie. And um, we've never called you like this before. We need you to look at this. And I'm so glad they did. I was just like, I, I said, I, you got absolutely. If you guys are calling me like this. Um, I just didn't think I was well suited for it before they for that phone call. You know, I, I told them what I'm looking for um, is to do things, um, to, to tell stories that feel like I'm the only one that should be telling them, you know, again, I'm not going to always get that right, but that's what I'm trying to do. And Sam just didn't feel like that was supposed to be me in the end. I, you know, it feels that way now, you know, I do feel like I said I had something unique to say through this story. Um, but I didn't feel that way. So no, I was terrified. I was terrified of not measuring up. I was terrified of, you know, while I had played Burr and I played William still, these were not people that you could pull up, um, you know, you couldn't just easily pull up uh, images and, and voice recordings and things to measure me up against. Certainly Burr, nobody was expecting me to look or sound like Aaron Burr. William Still, we have his writings, but nobody was expecting me to, to walk like William Still or talk like William Still. So this was a new challenge. And um, with the help of Regina, a brilliant dialect coach, Trey Cotton, my scene partners, who also do a great deal in helping you create character. You know, the way that they treat you, the way they relate to you, informs you about who you are. And then that brilliant script by Kemp Powers. Um, I was able to to find a way to, to do some work that I'm proud of in this movie. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing it. So we'll do one more question and then uh, that is time for us. And this is a fun one. It, what is the one Broadway character you dream of playing? And then I'm going to take it a little bit bigger. Outside of Broadway, do you have a, a remake of an old film that you would like to do now that you've, you've got experience playing historical figures or something like that? What is your dream role in film and what's your dream role on Broadway? Mm -hmm. 
my dream role on Broadway, uh, it's a show that not, not many of you guys are gonna know, but there's a show called Pearly uh, that Ozzy Davis wrote. It was a play called Pearly Victorious and then it got turned into a musical called Pearly. There's not many is the, is the hard part because but Lynn wrote one of the greatest roles of all time, especially for an actor of color. You know, there's great roles out there for, for white actors. This is not me being that guy. You know, what happens is though, it doesn't always work to put a black face on those roles. Sometimes they are they are culturally specific. And if if and when I go and I try to attempt to play some of these roles, it just doesn't make sense all the way down. You start to peel back the layers and you go, wait, who am I? And am I living in this time really? And could I really have done these things? And could I have been? So it's, it gets really tricky. Um, so I, I'm limited when I, when I look at the canon of musical theater or theater, you know, for that matter, I'm limited a little bit. I have to depend on these, these future generations of great writers to hopefully write me another great part or two. But Pearly, is one of those is one of those show, one of the few shows that I I get excited about and I think could still speak today. It's about um, a, a young preacher who I haven't looked at it in a long time, but a young preacher who wants to buy this patch of land so that he could so that he can own it himself. It is owned by old Captain, you know. It's owned by this old Confederate former slave owner who now has the black people living on his land and sharecropping for him to own the, to, to to rent essentially this piece of land so that they can have their church and pearly wants to own it he wants to own it outright and it's, it's a beautiful little symbolic story that i think could still speak today unfortunately unfortunately and then my role in film uh, you know the 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 dream role in film. Eventually, I don't I don't think I'm some Steven Spielberg in the making, but there is I I would like to direct one movie. There's a movie that I have in mind that I think about a lot that I'd like to direct. So my the the role of director someday. I was going to suggest actually that you start creating a revival of Pearly, but it sounds like maybe you could adapt it into a film and kind of kill two birds with one stone there. My guy, there you go. There you, go. you can take that. All right. Well, Leslie, thank you so much for this conversation. I am going to be riding high all day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everybody watching. Please check the, the link in YouTube here. Listen to the album at least once. If you like it, listen to it multiple times. Make Amen. sure that you catch One Night in Miami on Amazon. And if you haven't yet, catch Hamilton the movie on Disney Plus. Check it out. Check it out because it's, it's not just, bad. It's just great. So yeah, Leslie, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Bye guys.